Thank you, Richard. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to um, talk to you about um, this book that I've edited. It's called Poems from the Edge of Extinction. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a poet and an editor of that book and a writer. I also work as the National Poetry Librarian at the National Poetry Library at South Bank Centre. Um, so I'm going to talk you through the process of, um, uh, of editing this, this book, uh, Poems from the Edge of Extinction. Uh, it's an anthology of poetry in endangered languages. Um, so the, the book contains uh, poems written in languages from every continent in the world. Um, so examples from each continent and also poems written in, in dialect as well. Um, and increasingly the book has become um, it's become a kind of a framework for poets who write in dialect as well. Um, so I've been organising events with UK poets who write in, in the indigenous dialect, if you like. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of background on, um, on, the, on the book and then I'm going to, you're going to hear some of the poems. I've got a few of them in the original language. I couldn't get all of them in the original language for today, but I've got some of that I thought was really important to be able to hear um, the poets speaking their poems in their language. Um, so I'll show you a little bit about the background of the, the project. So this is where I work um, in London. It's You probably know this building. It's the Royal Festival Hall on the South Bank. Um, the National Poetry Library is based at the South Bank Centre. Um, and the South Bank Centre itself has got a long history of poets and poetry, going back to 1951 and the Festival of Britain. Um, in fact, Dylan Thomas, the great Welsh poet, who didn't actually speak Welsh, um, came and visited and wrote this amazing report, um, newspaper report um, about the festival. And ever since then, poets have been welcome to the site and they've performed their, their poems in these spaces that we have, 18 acres of space. Um, and we run a festival called Poetry International, which was set up in 1967 by Ted Hughes. And poets from W.H. Auden to Pablo Neruda, Anne Sexton, um, Sawley McLean, have, have visited over over the period of the last 60 odd years and performed the work as part of that festival. And hidden away on the left side of the building, um, the top window there, you can see um, the National Poetry Library, um, which is the national collection of poetry in the UK. Um, it's the largest public collection of poetry in the world and contains poetry in many, many different languages. Um, much of that is in translation, but in 2017, um, we launched a project called the Endangered Poetry Project. And this project was responding to um, the claims by linguists Many, many of you, are no doubt, linguists, and uh, activating, you know, this this way of thinking about languages, uh, claims by linguists that, um, uh, you know, half of the world's seven thousand languages uh, could uh, fall silent by the end of the century, um, and really that got me thinking about what that meant for poetry. You know, poetry as an art form, perhaps the art form that is most closely connected to us as, as human beings, very intimately connected um, to our identities uh, and, of course, our speech. Um, and not just thinking about poetry, but much broader, thinking about verbal art or oral art, uh, because many of these things we think about poems in other languages won't be written down. Um, but still, you know, there, there was this um, necessity for a project like this, I think, where uh, as languages disappear, um, whole um, ways of thinking about poetry disappear and, and verbal art, you know, things we can all learn from. Um, and also the, the poetry is a way into understanding a culture as well. Um, so what, we had a, a big figurehead behind us, I think, in the history of poetry, which is Dante, the um, 13th, 14th century uh, Italian poet. Um, and he, he really provides uh, a, a big inspiration for our project and, and for the anthology that, that has come out of the project um, because um, he made the decision when he wrote his epic major work, The Divine Comedy, uh, The Inferno, Pegatorio and Paradiso, to not write in the major language of the time which was Latin, um, he wrote instead in a, a Tuscan dialect. Um, and he underpinned his thinking of this by writing an, an unfinished book uh, called De, uh, De Vulgari Eloquentia, um, 
which argued for the vernacular to be given the same legitimacy as Latin. Um, so he'd obviously thought long and hard about this, and he was way ahead uh, of most people thinking about language at that time, because he saw language uh, very much as a fluid thing. It wasn't this static entity that had or should have automatic privilege. He saw it as a fluid, ever-evolving uh, material, if you like. And how right he was, because um, his his book has had such an impact in Italy, it's played a part in the spoken form of Italian becoming the, the, the standard Italian of today, if you like. And for that reason, he's often described as the, as the father of the Italian language. So we had a great figurehead behind us, um, and we um, announced that we were going to do a call-out um, for people to send us their poems, um, poems they knew in endangered languages from the UK, but anywhere in the world. It could be written, it could be audio. Um, we were lucky to get The Guardian behind it, so they um, um, put this piece out on National Poetry Day in 2017. And from there, we had people submitting their poems through to us um, in an Italian dialect, Sardinian dialect, which was a nice connection with the Dante, um, in some of the UK languages, of course, um, but also as far away as Malaysia. You know, somebody had heard about it and um, sent us a sent us a poem in a in a language called Chris Tang. Um, so I just want to start with um, like playing one of these poems that was submitted to us. It's in Shetlandic. Um, and this poem is by a poet called John Peterson, uh, who died in 1972. And it's really about um, the dynamics of the sea and the fish trade. Um, and it recounts um, the quite precarious lives of, of Shetlandic fishermen um, who um, would have to make a decision while they were out at sea whether to um, bring their haul back to Shetland and sell it in Shetland, or to go much further to Aberdeen or Peterhead and to, to sell their fish there. So it goes into um, the kind of language of, uh, 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 of the fishermen and being at sea. So it asks, what's the price of haddock in Aberdeen today? You know, is it worth us going to Aberdeen to sell the fish? Um, it's got lots of code words, venture calling daybreak, venture calling daybreak. Uh, and also some really specific words from Shetlandic. Um, briggy stains, which are, um, as some of you may know, are huge slabs that form a dry path around the house. So uh, the, the the speaker of the poem imagines the original Norsemen who, who came to Shetland uh, being so familiar with the sea that, that um, it was like they had their own slabs on the sea, they were that in control of it. And also a wonderful word, um, trivelin, um, which kind of has a suggestion of feeling kind of unsteady on the sea. Um, so I'll play this poem um, by John Peterson. Send Netters by John Peterson. Black arund and the steep seas marking, gunnel to gunnel till the decks run white. Mast hide light in a swirling moory, looping about like a fangin kite. Hello, 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 daybreak callin' venture, 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 daybreak callin' venture. Fag ain't glunt to the wheel whose window, tide lumps bracken like ghosts on the bim. Loss a sight to the land for a oor nu. This is the rod the Norseman come him. Swain and Hal and the bare-legged Magni, Bruzy the Black and Carl Brocken Baines, day and night with their in to the wastard, stramping the seas like their ain briggy stains. Hello, 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 twa drags, forty boxes, twa drags, forty, twa drags, forty boxes. Andrew John and Grace Anne's Robbie, Wally be north and hue for the head, day after day at the hert hole of winter, shotten, dragon and gotten like mad. Oot and awa for you and me's walk and never doon till lang after dark, trivelling their way be ba and be voder, fishermen making for him for their work. Venture callin' daybreak, 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 what's the price of haddocks in Aberdeen the day? The price, the price, and the north bar's bracken, what's the price brack's a winter's gill? 
Senses tune to a world of strapless, ready to act should anything fail. What's the price in the squall comes dirling, black car round, nor even a glim, compass, wheel, and an e to windward, had in the rod the Norseman come him. Christine de Luca, who submitted this poem, she talks about how there's something both very familiar and yet different in Shetlandic. Um, you know, it, 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 what she's saying is it sounds maybe quite similar to Scots. Scots speakers would follow a lot of it, but there's, um, because it is obviously a dialect of Scots, but there's something um, of Scandinavia in there as well. Um, and Shetlandic is defined by UNESCO as a vulnerable language. Um, so in this book, um, I kind of followed the UNESCO um, map of indigenous languages, really useful resource, which um, you know shows you the Wales languages and, and uh, gives you um, a definition of where UNESCO believes they are in terms of endangerment from uh, vulnerable through um, to um, definitely endangered or critically endangered. Um, but I wanted to move away from that as well. I didn't want to be tied to the UNESCO definition of things because we live in a world in which language is politicized. Um, and often um, there is a great level of endangerment to speakers of a language, even though that language might have millions and millions of speakers. Uh, so for example, we uh, I included the Rohingya um, language in the book. Um, at the time of, uh, of editing the book, um, about 650,000 Rohingya people have been forced from Myanmar to the edges of, of the country to live in camps. Um, and they were facing murder and rape and arson. Um, and of course, you know, this is intimately linked with language because in Myanmar, their, their language, the Rohingya language, does not have any status and it, it's not, it doesn't have a written form and the infrastructure doesn't allow them to access things like, you know, healthcare and things like that. Um, and also sometimes actually the act of writing poetry is a rebel act. Um, so I included some poems um, by Pashto women writers. Pashto has about 38 million speakers miles away from being endangered. However, um, to write poetry as an Afghan woman is an incredibly dangerous thing to do. Um, and um, a, an American journalist uh, traveled to Afghan following the death of a young female poet called Rahila Muskar. Um, she had set herself on fire in protest at not being allowed to write poetry. Um, and um, Eliza Griswold, the journalist, she met many of these um, Pashto-speaking women who had to whisper the poems to her. Um, they had to go to you know secret places to be able to share the, the, these these things. And the really funny, witty, kind of amazing works of literature uh, and really contemporary. Um, and if this all sounds like a million miles away from the UK, it's worth thinking about um, the... Um, you know this the the case of oppression really from Edward the first in the in the thirteenth century um so uh, King Edward the first of England um I should apologize for for mentioning King Edward the first in Scotland so um but it's all to the good because it's it's about resistance it's about rebellion um he obviously um t went to war with the Scots he also um you know tr trounced the welsh and um he um, he apocryphally, um, but there's enough source to, to say this is true. He um, killed 500 Welsh bards who refused to sing his praises, uh, and the story goes that there was one final Welsh bard um, in this picture. This is a picture by William Blake um, of the final Welsh bard um, pl plunging to his death in the sea rather than you know give allegiance to King Edward. Um, so, you know, it's not that long ago, really, that, that this situation with being endangered as a speaker of a language and as a poet existed in this country. Um, and I'm just going to just go off the UK slightly for a sec, just not too far away, though, because um, I want to think about um, uh, this idea of politicised language, but also what happens kind of in the body of the speaker where the language is oppressed. Um, and we had this poem submitted to the project um, in Alsatian, 
Um, so Alsatian being a language spoken historically in Alsace. Uh, we've got a Als- Alsace. Uh, almost. I'm yeah. almost from there, but kind Fantastic. of. Fantastic. That's I really good. I used to great. live in Strasbourg anyway. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's really great. Um, so, I mean, you, you'll know more about the background of this, but um, the, the poem's written by a French poet called uh, Claude Vigier, who spoke Alsatian as well. And he writes this poem um, about being at school um, in France after the Second World War. And um, it's suddenly being um, um, not allowed to speak Alsatian. Um, and they had this um, pro, um, policy in France of unremembering Alsatian. So the children went back to school and um, there was posters on the wall in the school that said things like, um, um, learn a new French word every day and forget a, forget an Alsatian one. You know, it'd be as simple as that. Um, but in this really wonderful poem, um, Claude Vigier, he, he kind of gets inside what that felt like in their bodies as, as, as speakers of that language to have to fight back the language that was intimately connected to their identities. It's called Black Nettles Blaze in the Wind. Since it's erupted in our windpipes as quickly as it had vanished, gulped down at the bottom of our wells, the forever silenced language of childhood, why do we stand there like helpless beggars, all dazed and crooked, bare hands extending? All this life, we dismissed it on the grounds of sickness, though slowly stifling ourselves as we stood away from it. Always this foolish air of panic, of being struck half dumb, our hoarse voices, broken long ago, suddenly stopped. Already on our school bench, in the thrall of the forceps of language, we felt like tongue cripples tangled up in our songs. What would be the point of anger or scorn? What do we have left after all this hurt? A bottomless tear in the empty pockets of our ragged and tattered carnival costumes. The only trick that seemed to work for us, be good now, do as they say. That's the lot of poor true wretches, true poor wretches. Patience, patience, advised the professors to us hotheads. Do not bend the rope too quickly around your necks, for many a bird before has shat on its own nest. Be clever like Mrs. Mellor's cat. Keep your claws hidden in a velvet glove, or may you endure the guilt of having cursed yourselves with the plagues and havocs of the entire world. God knows what will happen then. And so we single-handedly clinched the nail that clung to our shackles. Um, What comes through that poem is um, this sense of um, the school children being um, made to feel grotesque to themselves, Um, like this part of themselves is being cut off and they don't know quite who they are anymore. Um, The poet and translator David Constantine um, writes that a a people's identity springs in large measure from its language. For that reason, when one people or nation annexes another or wishes to homogenize itself, it will control or even seek to exterminate the language within its frontiers by which heterogeneity is signaled and asserted. Um, So I think what comes through Vijay's poem there is that um, when they were free to speak Alsatian, they were free to be individuals, um, it, and when it was cut off from them, when they were cut off from their mother tongue, um, they were cut off from themselves, so they felt kind of wretched and out of shape and kind of distorted to themselves. Um, I just want to keep hold of that idea through the rest of this, this talk about you know, poetry as an art form that lives intimately in the body of the speaker and, and the recipient of it as well. Um, the book contains many um, poets who are the last speakers of their language, um, and really, it was it, it was one of the most um, um, surprising, I suppose, things to find in editing this book that um, 
in a lot of the, a lot of languages where it's, it's come down to the last speakers, there is always a poet amongst the last speakers, um, and this came sort of for with um, the p language of Petua from um, from Macau. So I was, I, I've been to Macau for a poetry conference, and I really wanted to find a poet who, who spoke or wrote or in um, Petua, and I was told that it was very unlikely. Uh, you might find carols sung in Petua, but you wouldn't find a, a, a poet. Um, but an academic said, you know, try this guy, Miguel S. Fernandez. Um, he, he might know someone. And uh, I did use Facebook. It was the only way I could find him and sent a message. And a week later, he got back to say, uh, hi, Chris, to my knowledge, I'm afraid I'm the only one writing poems in Petua these days. And I hope I'm wrong. How can I help? Um, and he's included in the book. Um, it's just this amazing galvanizing moment to feel this connection um, with a, a last speaker of a language who is also a poet. Um, and we find this in the Livonian as well, the language of Latvia, which incredibly has around 20 speakers of this language left. And amongst those 20 speakers, three of them are poets, three of them are published poets. Um, so you have this kind of ratio where, um, you know, the number of speaker, uh, poets to speakers increases as the language language decreases, or as the speakers of the language decrease. Um, and, you know, L Livonian has been reported by UNESCO um, to be a, a dead language. Um, and that's absolutely not the case, because I've, I've been on a stage with one of the speakers of that language, who's a poet, Valt Ernstraits. Um, so I think coming back to the UK, there's a there's a poem in the UK written in Manx. Um, you know, Manx um, was also falsely falsely reported to be uh, a dead language by UNESCO again uh, in 2009. I sometimes wonder whether UNESCO do this um, just to like you know kind of uh, activate a language. So it's died off, and then uh, you know there's this response then of like you know how dare they say that? So, there's, there's loads of us, you know, and some of us are poets, and then, you know, um, this, this kind of activation begins. Um, but certainly with UNESCO, it's a premature statement, and um, there's a, book, a poem in the book by Robert Carswell, who's also a broadcaster in Manx, and a, um, a poet in Manx. Um, I'm not going to read the whole of this poem, but um, I'm just going to um, just maybe just read the last um, part of, of the poem. Um, because it's quite an interesting image and quite an important image. The speaker of the poem uh, w walks into a landscape and finds a tree, and the, it's an autumn tree, and the leaves have fallen from the tree. Um, and at the end of the poem, um, he says, um, he kind of literally lies down on, onto the leaves to feel the roots of the tree kind of against his body. I am bending down to put my head against this ground that attracts heads and bodies enough in the hope that it feeds my very soul. Um, and I think there's something, well, the first thing to say, I suppose, is um, you read a poem like this very differently when it's been written in, a, in an endangered language like Manx. It's, a, it's kind of impossible to um, engage with this poem and not think about what this says about the language itself about leaves dying and about the roots of the tree, um, but also really important, importantly about the body of the speaker, the, the body of the speaker in which the language lives uh, as the one who carries the language. Um, and this thinking about the, the past and, and the future and the speaker being that connection between the past and future speakers as well. And of, but of course, when it's in poetry, it, it, it transmits as a form of, of activation for that language as well. He says, um, he ends with, with hope, in the hope that it feeds my very soul. Um, and similarly, the po poet who we have in the book called um, Meg Bateman, who some of you may know, she's a um, Scottish Gaelic um, linguist, I believe, and um, activist for the language as well as being a poet. Um, it's a poem which, it, again, engages with landscape. It's called I Love This House. Um, and... Um, she is walking through a house uh, while the child is asleep in, in bed. And again, you have this sense of, um, you know, the, the future generation being silent and it being a kind of unknown quantity, whether the child will, will wake and speak the language. Um, so it got me thinking about 
the interaction, the relationship between poets and biodiversity, which runs through the entire entire anthology. Uh, I interviewed um, some poets for a magazine called Modern Poetry and Translation, because the latest issue uh, focused on extinction. And I asked some of the poets in the book what their relationship between their language was and um, and the landscape, if you like. Um, so uh, Nineb Lamassu, Iraqi poet who writes in Assyrian, um, he says, in one of the remote Assyrian villages in no northern Iraq, I managed to document no less than 100 such medical plants because I was fortunate enough to find an elderly person who knew all these plants. Last year, this elderly person passed away, and this year I visited the village, and no one knew these plants and what they were used for. Um, you know, that's just the kind of thing that a poet would do, you know, feeling that there's something uh, worthwhile in, in documenting this language for, my, for myself, um, because it, it is the substance of, of the work. Uh, to find a hundred names for plants is absolute goldmine for a poet. Um, and he also talks about um, the, the, the being uh, in, his, in the part of Iraq. He, he grew up in um, 10 different kinds of sh um, sheep um, excrement. Um, not only that, each with a specific use. Uh, and I, I kind of thought, like, you know, we're used to this, you know, the Eskimos analogy of, of snow. And I kind of think, well, you know, we've basically just got shit and they've got, uh, <laughs> you know, all these different uses for sheep excrement. Um, and I also asked... Um, uh, Vaughan Rapatahana, Maori poet, who, um, who told me about um, this act that's just been passed in New Zealand, the uh, Te Awa Tapua Wanganui River Settlement Act of 2017. Some of you may know this, but it's absolutely radical and, uh, for me, groundbreaking and exactly what we should be doing everywhere in the world. Um, the government has granted this river human rights, I just want like, everyone to think about that for a minute. The, the, the river has, has actual human rights. Um, and, you know, in the, po in the history of poetry, this isn't strange, of course, because uh, going back to Ovid and the metamorphosis, poetry transforms things and it attributes human qualities to everything. Um, and I, I think this is the role that poetry can play by acting on intuition, you know, an, an intuitive way of looking at reality i.e. the way poets have always looked at reality is actually allowing us to to look after the world that we live in. Um, I'm going to just move into translation because I've, I've drifted off to New Zealand um, and this is the UK we're talking about. And I've got two short pieces to play really, um, one Welsh and then something in, um, in Irish Gaelic as well. And um, this is um, a poem by Gwyneth Lewis. And I'm thinking about um, another strand of the book, translation, and what it means for a poet who writes in an endangered language to self-translate, if they choose to do that, to not translate, to also write in English, or just to write in their own language, because um, there's this incredible tension that exists in the world of the poet between standing by their language um, and knowing that it might not reach a, a bigger audience. Um, and there's no kind of answer to this because poets have addressed it in different ways. So I just want to introduce some of those different ways in which poets have thought about translation. Um, Cyfwyliad ar bardd gan Gwyneth Lewis. O edrych yn ôl, rwy'n beio'r cyfieithu. Dechreuais yn 1973 ar iard yr ysgol. Dim ond tipyn o sbri o ddei ddachre, am bell reg, am y weather, fuck off. A hoffai steimlo mwg ail iaith yng nghefn fy llwnc a brath chwerwy gemig. Sy'n mynd eis ymlaen at frawddegau cyfan y tu ôl yr sied ac yn sydyn roedd gwersi am ddewi sant yn llain y diddorol. Dechreuais ar brint, darllen Jeeves yn Wooster, straeon James Bond, wedi eu cuddio mewn cloriau Cymraeg. Gwyddodd hyn yn beth amser nes i mam ddarganfod Dick Francis Ti fewn i'r bardd cwsg, i nos yr ôl capel. Fe ges i stŵr anhygoel a chrasfa. Roedd hithen wraig bir, un iaith am oes. Ond roedd yn rhy hwyr i fi erbyn hynny. Symudais ymlaen at ffrangeg a ffroen ni geiriau simen o a ffloo bair. Rwy'n ni'n darllen mwy i gael yr un effaith nawr. 
a rhwng pob pryd yn traflyncu geirfa rhag bod yn chwys drybw yn y dosbarth. Un noson, fe ges i lond y bola o ofn ar ôl darllen llawer gormod o'r prwst, llywygais. Es yn ôl at y Gymraeg yn unig am dipyn, ond roedd fel uwd tu halen ar ôl siwgr y blas fy nanteithio'n tramor, cyn bo hir, rhwn i'n ôl yn cyfieithu, ond nid oedd tair yn ddigon o ieithoedd. Troes at yr almaeneg a rilca gan fod sŵnch yn gyfarwydd eisoes. Y mae rhyw yn rhan o'r broblem i ffetisiddiaeth fel fi, byddai umlawt yn codi chwys arnaf am oriau. Y mae angen dyn aml ieitho y mae angen dyn aml ieitho garnaf, ond mae'r hyn i'n bryn yn yr ardal, yn briod. Pen biaswn ni wedi'n hadw fy hun yn lân am chwaith yn fwy syml, byddai'r Gymraeg yn fyw heddi. Detectif, rydych chi'n dod o Japan, yng nghanwch air neu ddau yn fy nglist i roi rhyw syniad. Plis, detectif, rwy'n begian. It's one of those poems that makes makes me feel me Welsh is up to scratch. Um, I have no idea. Fuck off as Welsh. Um, <laughs> so what she's exploring there is um, through this uh, this really strong idea that uh, Welsh is being murdered, and a detective turns up, you know, wanting to uh, investigate, um, and the speaker feels like a culprit. You know, it's like, um, what was your role in the crime? And her role in the crime was that she was seduced by other languages. Um, she started off with Welsh when she was young, but then sexier languages came along uh, and lured her away from, from her, her indigenous language. Um, so that's one kind of interesting idea about the temptations of other languages that a poet might feel uh, and experience. Um, and I'm going to um, just end, because I want to save a little bit of time for questions, with uh, Irish Gaelic. Um, and the po poem in this book is by... Uh, Geroid McLaughlin, and it's called Translations. And um, this poem, um, it, it, it depicts a poet who's at a poetry event, and it's a bilingual poetry event, and the speaker of the poem is an Irish Gaelic poet. Um, and um, they come to the event, and they're in um, the same room that um, the English language poets are in, uh, the much better known poets. Um, the Seamus poets, um, and the poet suddenly feels that they're a fad, like they're a kind of um, a, a tokenistic gesture, if you like. No one really gets it, but, you know, it's good to have a bit of Irish Gaelic in, in, in the room. Um, and we, we worked at the National Poetry Library with the National Theatre uh, to make a video on this. Um, it's a short two-minute two video, I'll play it now. Uh, they were showing their um, production of uh, Brian Friel's translations, uh, which is exploring a very similar theme to, to um, McLaughlin's poem. Um, and the, the video is set inside the National Poetry Library and with McLaughlin's permission, uh, they used two actors to to kind of um, play out the dynamics of his poem in his language. Um, so I think Richard's gonna just click this on for me now, is it? Ni astruachan a klosig shivanok to korda. Me astraha atraha is quailaha la hishka eraha and verla. A ye nok lemonad huli nok dain darog maquid filiokta. No. Tonight there will be no translations. Sheratar rogamna. What am I doing here anyway? Is this just the latest fashion? A fad. The bilingual reading. Poetry Esquelga. Had the world gone mad? Anima, Irene too tear shock the clusa falsa Ernica. Fain sauce of on monoglat, a dare lat. That sounds lovely. I wish I had the Irish. Don't you do translations? Edic stana erm gamor hulok. Maristana karain karna karin. Me compor the canal or her. And how glad they are when it's all over. Glad the English poet is up next, with a few jokes to smooth over the slight hitch in the evening. 
And here he is with his talk of cafe culture and Seamus. Here he is to prove to them they are with a broad-minded and cultured. That they get the gist of this poetry thing, the tops and tails of the evening. Here he is now. Agashin Misha, on shoed howl a manor. A gar nail magruma, extana gahedver. Olta er Ian rua maquid filiacta. Maquid filiacta guelga. Nor higenia. Suddenly feel very English. Um, so uh, that's on YouTube as well, so you can you can watch it again if you like. Um, I just I just want to finish with. Um, I mean, there's so many questions that raises that 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 video. Um, you know, I think it's in the video itself, um, and maybe we can talk about them in, in the questions shortly. But I just want to finish on um, uh, a quote, um, or well, it's more than a quote, really. It's something I believe in um, that poetry isn't separate from from its languages ever, um, and linguists. Um, some linguists have made real claims for the for the importance of poetry in terms of understanding um, a language. Um, Roman Jacobson, um, you know, the great theorist of the twentieth century, um, said that the linguist whose field is any kind of language may and must include poetry in his study or her study. Um, and um, he was friends with Vladimir Mayakovsky, one of the you know, great 20th century poets. Um, and more recently, Nicholas Evans in his book, uh, Dying Words, um, he, he writes that the emergence of a particular special device in oral literature, a new language game cutting syllables in a particular way, or a new type of alliteration, or a new metrical template in poetry, can actually nudge the whole language system in a particular direction by adding another cookie cutter for speakers to use the dough of the speech around them. It is for this reason that a co-evolutionary framework is helpful in studying verbal art. It reminds us that the impact of artistic creativity does not stop at the work itself, but flows on to the rest of the language system. Um, so I just wanted to, to end on that note because, um, you know, I don't, I don't think that poetry is separate from language in the same way as poets aren't separate from humanity um, and this image that Nicholas Evans gives us is, is really useful I think with kind of um, something invented in poetry can be like a cookie cutter kind of cutting out the dough of language and that can be passed on to the whole of the language system itself um, but yeah I'll stop there thank you very much Poetry can really be a window into uh, the culture around a language. But I find in language learning, because poetry is so complex, uh, many language learners uh, completely avoid or ignore poetry. So do you have any tips for how language learners can uh, approach uh, poetry? Yeah, I think um, the, the number one tip would be to, to listen to it rather than trying to read it. Um, so I think I suppose that we... we have had and do have a lot of language learners who come to listen to the audio collection um which is, you know is a, a strange concept in some ways because you know they you know you could imagine a, a speaker of a language kind of speaking the language like lewis carroll or you know james joyce you know it's kind of a you know it can be very complicated um so the second tip would be um you know to select poets that um write in quite simple language I suppose it could be complicated ideas but um, you know the great inventors within the language probably isn't, isn't a good place to begin to to learn the language but uh, but also you know just making poetry part of it I think rather than something that I think it comes from the teacher as well actually if a teacher is um, is scared of poetry that's probably that's going to transmit to the students um, so having this thing that Nicola, Nicholas Evans talks about that poetry is part of part of the language is part of you know the culture uh, so you know embrace embrace it as you go as you go along with your language learning thank you so much thank you richard